Chapter 27 Killing Me Softly We are now entering 1968, and 1968 was a wild ride. Martin Luther King was assassinated in the spring. Riots in Detroit just happened, and the hippies were emerging as a significant political group. Women's liberation was just getting started, and it was rumored that women were burning their bras. I guess that was never really true, but it made great headlines. I believed it then. The best thing that happened to me was my sister went to college. I was finally an only child. I had started out as one as five. Richard left for college when I was one. Robert left when I was seven. Marilyn left when I was eight. And now Jane. I got the whole upstairs to myself for four whole years. No more sharing beds with Jane. Her bed was always made and mother thought she was a great child to make her own bed every day. She didn't. She never slept in her bed. She never took her dishes back to the kitchen, and she never cleaned. It was always me. Jane had it made in the shade. Mother would scream up the steps once in a while, saying she had no dishes in the kitchen, and would I be so kind to bring some back down to the kitchen? Jane rarely did this and always left it for me, but now I did not have to deal with her anymore. She packed up and left, and I was thrilled. She came home every weekend for the first year, but that was okay, just as long as she left Sunday afternoon. I was good. Jane lived a typical dorm life and stayed away from any protests or student demonstrations. My future friends had taken over the ROTC building in 1967 wearing no bras, not shaving, and demanding peace, not war, as our goal. Jane was trying to fit in, though, and protesting did not fit into her psyche. She had started to date Bill, and graduating was her goal. World politics be damned. This change in eras worked out a little differently for me. It divided our family into two eras. The first four children were products of war and production. I was a product of war and resistance. Before Jane left for college, we had a rare sister moment. I think I stated before that Mother rarely came upstairs. But one night, Jane and I were being rather silly and laughing and laughing about something. Mother came to the steps and threatened to come upstairs, which we found implausible and started to laugh even harder. She asked gruffly what we were laughing about and again threatened to come upstairs. We continued laughing and laughing. We could tell Mother was getting madder and madder, which just made us laugh even harder, and the cycle continued. We heard her foot strike the first step, and we lost it. We heard another step and then another quickly coming up towards us. We stopped laughing for a moment and looked at each other in disbelief. Then, as Mother approached the curve in the steps, the sound of her foot striking the steps slowed down significantly. She was damn near panning when she reached the top step, and we start laughing even harder. She stuck her head around the corner and saw us there lying in bed laughing, and she could not punish us. She realized she was over her head and started to laugh too, leaving as abruptly as she came. The next time she came upstairs, I was an adult home from college with a bunch of my siblings and their spouses. The beds got a little switched up, and Mother and I found ourselves in the same bed as Jane and I had been years earlier. I told her the story of her coming up the steps threatening to punish Jane and I. I got her laughing and laughing about it until someone came to the bottom of the steps and asked us what was wrong, at which point Mother really lost it. I was back in home economics class, and it was time to learn to bake cookies. That particular day, we were making chocolate chip cookies, and everyone was excited. Mrs. Miller turned to me and said, You bake cookies, right? I said yes, and that I had helped her made them many times. She said, Good. See you later, and turned on her heel and left. Wonderful news. I loved it when the adults left us to our own devices. My friends were not going to listen to me that day, so I got busy making my own cookies. Several girls did ask me questions, but I only knew how my family baked them, not why. So I can only tell them that we never melt the butter first, but without explanation, they don't believe me. One girl melted her butter, and her cookies flowed all over the pan. One girl barely creamed the butter and sugar together, so hers turned out grainy. Others put their cookies too close together and ended up with big blobs. The biggest problem, though, was under or over baking our cookies. Most were edible, even if they were a little ugly. Mrs. Miller thought we did a great job, so that's all that mattered. The boys ate all the cookies as soon as we left class, so it was actually a good day. As I said before, 
I was starting to date and knew some of my friends were having sex. Mm, I didn't really understand, but I pretended I did. I did realize by then that sex would get me pregnant and married before Friday. But as my main goal at that point was getting out of town, there was no way in bloody hell I was having sex and getting stuck in Kingston for the rest of my life. I would probably beat the poor baby in my misery. But that did put a cramp in the fun for the last two years of high school. The only man I sure wanted to have sex with me anyway was the band instructor. All I had to do was stay away from him for the next two years. The next year was a long one in which I now needed to avoid one boy that gave me a hard time at band camp and the band instructor. We were slowly circling the drain as far as graduation went. I got into the school play, but when mother and dad said they wouldn't attend, I just barely walked through the process and blew some of my lines. I didn't care. All I could think of was leaving. I was accepted into college and filled out my forms. My sister told me to try to get into one particular dorm, which I filled out under her supervision. Later, when I complained that it was fourth-year students, the ones who never leave the dorm, she laughed at me and said, yeah, it's the worst dorm. I never asked her anything again in my life that had any consequences. We still had homecoming to go, and I was not functioning to the best of my abilities. The wind was out of my sail. Mother and Dad seemed really happy the end was near for their years of child-rearing. Dad was in full drinking form. Mother continued to work when she wasn't on vacation. Thirty-six years of raising kids. They had a child in the home from 1936 through 1972. Thirty-six years is a long time. I understand their excitement now looking back, but for me it's tinged with a little resentment. I continued to go downhill into that last fall of high school. I just couldn't function, and my side hurt all the time. Riding the bus killed me, and walking was getting harder and harder. I knew Mother would be furious with me if I got sick because Dad was leaving for camp soon, and she had to run the show by herself. I thought maybe sleeping at Elner's would help me feel better. Dad left on a Thursday for hunting camp. Near the end of World War II, around 1944, Dad got sick. His side hurt terribly, and he had a hard time walking. His condition got worse and worse, and Mother finally took him to the hospital a bit a little late as his appendix had already burst. He was a very sick man. Since the war was almost over, the government authorized the release of a new miracle drug called penicillia. That was the only thing that saved Dad. Without it, he would have been toast. He stayed in the Pontiac Hospital for the better part of a month before coming home. The illness must have been really scary for my mother. Shouldn't this have taught her a thing or two about appendicitis? My value sank a little lower. When Marilyn was, say, in her late teens, but before she was married, she had appendicitis. Mother had taken her by ambulance to Cassidy to get her appendix out. For the life of me, I cannot remember one thing about this event. I've heard about it. But I don't remember the ambulance, or Marilyn being gone, or even Marilyn being sick for that matter. Mother said she was 17. I would have been 9. Is this a second appendix attack? I wonder if there was ever a first appendix attack. That timeline does not make sense to me as Marilyn was married at 16. Anyway, back to me and my trials and tribulations. I was suffering and I still could not tell Mother I was sick. Dad left as scheduled. We were all relieved to have him go. I never thought of about him as someone who would help me, so it never crossed my mind to tell him anything. We waved goodbye in the driveway and headed back to Elner's. The next day I was convinced I was dying. I finally told Mother I was sick and in serious pain. She was only slightly aggravated and called Elner. Elner was busy with cards and would not go with us to the hospital. Mother decided no ambulance was needed as it was a waste of money with Marilyn. We headed off to Marlott Hospital together, the number one wait and bake in my area. Before we left, I told Mother to change her clothes so we looked like we had value. Otherwise, I would be in real trouble. Mother agreed. She changed, and off we went. At least this time, we could take the main road and not the back way past all the swamps. Thankfully, she realized it was appendicitis right away. We got to the hospital, and they started testing me. 
The hospital was quiet, so I got some attention, which was not something I was used to getting. They determined I had appendicitis and called in a surgeon who came down to talk to me. He said they would have to operate at 6.30, which I assumed he meant in the morning, and I started to cry. He asked me why I was crying, and I admitted I didn't think I would make it till morning. He was so kind to me. He said, no, 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 I mean in an hour, just after I get a sandwich in me because I'm so hungry. I was so relieved and stopped crying. The nurse told me that appendicitis and childbirth are close to the same pain level, so if I could handle the pain, I could handle childbirth. It was sort of crazy she told me that, but we sat and poked and joked about it for quite a while. It totally distracted me as we waited for the doctor to eat his sandwich. Of course, the excitement was just getting started. It's a small community hospital, and it didn't have a bathroom in my room. I had to go down the hall, which was extremely inconvenient. Mother kept forgetting to bring me a robe or a radio or even a frickin' book. The hospital had none of these amenities. I wanted to watch a movie one of the nights, and I didn't have a TV, but could order one. Mother said, no, you'll only be here a few more days. Just to make it all more memorable, I start my period. The only supplies the hospital had were huge tugboats to ride, and I mean huge from navel to backside. I ended up with diaper rash and a fever. I knew they would not let me go home with a fever. Thankfully, the le nurse left me alone with the mercury thermometer registering my temperature. I got the temp just right where I wanted it and shoved that thermometer back in my mouth when I heard the nurse in the doorway. I succeeded and they let me go. I was in a mental and physical mess by the time Mother brought me home. I remember sitting in the family room just staring off into space. My sisters had come to the hospital for a 20-minute visit, and really it was worse than no visit. Dad returned from hunting camp and said he knew I was going downhill before he left, but he thought I could make it until I got back. Ten days later. Wow, Dad. My value is pretty low in this family. How much longer? By then I was getting close to graduation and was thrilled as I counted the days. I had a couple of classes I had to pass to graduate and I was not quite sure how I was going to do it. I finally broke down and read some of my government book. Chemistry was not going to be that easy. I did not comprehend a word the teacher said. First, he was a little odd and explained the chemistry concepts in a haphazard manner. I just couldn't follow him at all. I needed a plan to get through the final. If I failed, I wouldn't be leaving Kingston, and that was unacceptable. And I cheated. Extra points could be earned by knowing chemistry formulas, and I knew five. I just repeated these three times, got 15 extra points, and thus earned a B. My clever trick worked, and I saved my ass from living in Kingston the rest of my life. No one wanted me there anyway.